Welcome on the Evolve Fitness Podcast. Today, we have Nimrod and Victor Black on the podcast. So it's mainly focused on PEDs and the Black model, but not only. Uh, we are also talking about genetics, about training, about nutrition, optimization, about substance drug selection, about dosage, about some protocols which are used and better options to these protocols. We are talking about like elite in the sports and how to know if you are part of the elite and if you should then push things a bit further or not try it. Um, and also we are touching a bit about female use of PEDs and some spicy topics about trendbolone use in females. So I think it's a very, very interesting podcast. We really go in details into all these topics. Um, so I think it will be a very interesting one for you. So without further ado, let's dive in and enjoy the podcast. So uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Victor, for being with us. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, sensible subjects like uh, bro sciences and uh, mistakes about PEDs. Mm -hmm. So, Victor, you are the creator of the Black Safer Use model. In my opinion, one of the biggest minds when it's coming about anabolics and uh, ancillaries and everything. Tell me about the basal concept about the black safe for use model. Okay. Uh, I like that cat, by the way. I just popped that in there. <laughs> he won't be joining us for the show. No. <laughs> um, let, let me wind back a little bit before that. I think to understand what the black models are about, you really firstly have to understand the historical context of recreational use of performance enhancing drugs. Without that understanding, they don't really make any sense. Yeah. I, I think it's, an accurate observation to say, I've never met anyone that disagrees with this, and that is, historically, we tended to lean into performance enhancing drugs by talking about anabolic steroids. That's what we meant. In the 1970s time frame, when you said performance enhancing drugs, what you actually were talking about was anabolic steroids. Yeah, And historically, we tended to lean into them very heavily. In other words, that was the drug that we started with, and we may have started relatively moderately first, you know, ca you know, cab off the rank as it were, but gradually over time, we added more and more and more anabolic steroids to the table to the point where we ultimately reached a point of what you would have to agree with systemic toxicity. And it's from that toxicity that we needed to develop application models like Blast and Cruise. So uh, I'm assuming your audience would be familiar. If, if there's any language that I use that you think your audience wouldn't be familiar with, please tell me so I can you know, ex either explain it or, or simplify. I'm not quite sure where I should pitch the message. So if I ever, if I'm, if I'm under positioning or over positioning, just tell me I can move up or down either way. So, so terms like blast cruise, I'm assuming your audience goes, yes, I know what that means. Yeah, Is that fair? it's all right. right. It's okay, all right. Cool. I think that's going to be okay. So. Right. Yeah. So, so if you understand where blast cruise comes from, you know, the application of Toxic Drugs 101 says we apply drugs that we know to be toxic in a cyclic manner. We apply them, we, we recognize they apply stress, we remove them, we take a break to wash off the stress, we apply them. The classic example is, you know, cancer drugs like chemotherapy type drugs. You can't just apply them, apply them, apply them. They need to be applied the stress washed away and you apply them. So we have a, cy a cycle model. We apply the drugs, we remove them, we apply the drugs. Now, there's another model which we would refer to as generally like steady state. So you apply the drugs and fundamentally you leave them in play for life. Now, the interesting thing is most of the drugs that we use in bodybuilders, when you look at their clinical application, they're lifetime drugs. Testosterone replacement therapy is not cycled. Insulin therapy is not cycled. Growth hormone therapy is not cycled. Thyroid hormone therapy is not cycled. Metformin therapy is not cycled. You know, applications of you know the 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 more recent drugs that I have introduced to our tribe, like angiotensin receptor blockers. These are these none of these drugs are cycled. 
The only reason historically we cycled drugs because we used so much of them that we acknowledged we created a toxic environment that needed to have stress washed away. Now, I've never argued for one moment that does not work. For 30 years, we produced champions from Dorian Yates, you know, really, you know, from let's start with Arnold all the way through. Cycling toxic drugs works. You cannot argue it doesn't work. The problem is it's not sustainable. You can get away with the application of toxic drugs for a very short period of time. I mean, a few years and probably walk away relatively unscathed. But the one thing that has changed in bodybuilding, I would argue nothing has changed in bodybuilding 30 years. I've been doing this for 40 years. You know, and I've, I would argue that bodybuilding sport came of age about 50 years ago. About 40 years ago, I started to observe because I started training myself. And really, since Dorian Yates was crowned as Mr. Olympia, nothing has changed. I still eat the same way that I ate 30 years ago. I still train the same way I train. I still sleep the same way. And nothing has changed. And blast cruise models haven't changed for 30 years. The thing that's changed, the only thing that's changed is how long we do it for. There was a point where young men and women got into the sport and you did it for a block of time and then you retired. Yeah. Now everybody's doing it for 20, 30 years. I'm 40 years in now. That was unheard of at the time. If I was walking around at 55 years old in the shape that I'm in now, I would have been on the front cover of every bodybuilding magazine in the world because nobody existed at that point that looked like that. You know, so it wasn't that I'm so hyper muscular or have incredible condition. It's my age my God, he's 55 years old and he's been doing this for 40 years. So the point I'm making is this extension of time frame, right? And the historical practices cannot align to each other. You cannot blast cruise for 40 years. It's just not possible. So what I introduced for the very first time ever in our world was the idea of a rational, logical, evidence-based framework that says, we need a lifetime plan. For 30 years, people have been walking around telling us the ills that plague us, cardiovascular problems, renal health problems, lipid skewing, you know, oxidative stress. There's, there's nothing new about what plagues us, but no one ever had a plan. We just didn't have a plan. We did it and lived with the consequences and people often got in trouble or gave themselves a scare and they walked away. That's, that's our culture. And what I introduced was a rational framework that said, look, there's a time and a place for what we historically did. I've never argued otherwise. But you have to take that block of elevated risk and place it strategically in 40 years of exposure. You can't just do it and do it and do it and do it. It's impossible. You cannot argue. So if we take that block of time and say, we'll say that the average, let's talk men to begin with here, the average healthy young man could plausibly suck up that stress, to use a layman's term, for five years or six years. It's simply then a question of, so, right, where do we place that block of stress in a career? And then the most important question is, what are we going to do for the other 20 years? Yeah, that's a fair question. And so I developed a rational lifetime exposure model that says we start here, then we do this, then we do this, then we do this, then we do this. And eventually, inevitably, we will arrive at the point where we only have two choices. We either open the door and embrace our traditional models because that's what it requires to get to that level. Or we simply accept, you know what, based on my genetic response and my track record to date, I simply don't have what it takes to play the game. So I cannot justify even opening that door. I will simply try to ascertain what is plausibly possible for life. What can I do for the next 20 years? And I think the biggest mistake that people make, and they continue to mistake, make mistake, is in the NBA, they draw players from around the world. That is a global game. It's not an American game. It's a global game. And there are 450 players in the NBA. When you consider the number of players in the NBA and then there are 50 freaks, the idea that a recreational basketball player that likes to play on the weekends needs to follow the same type of training regime, right, 
as an NBA player, it's just not practical. It's like it's 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 like someone that has a bicycle and rides to ride the bike on the weekends having an interest in what Tour de France athletes do. Like, why are you even interested? I mean, if you're interested from a novelty point of view, that's a reasonable thing. You're interested and you want to know what's going on there. <laughs> but the truth is, young men in the gym want to know what Ronnie Coleman was doing because they want to do it. They actually want to do it. And that's the problem. No one ever had enough rational thought to say, look, it works, but it's not sustainable and the one thing that's happening here is Arnold retired at 28 years old. That's, you know, we don't do that anymore. We have guys winning Mr. Olympia in their 40s. Mm. The game has changed, but the thinking never changed. And so what happens, you end up with these unsustainable models that work and people trying to apply them for just the vector of time. The, the entire conversation is the vector of time. Does that all make sense? Yeah? yeah. Yes, absolutely. So the so the black models are nothing more than this saying, we're going to do that. I can tell you what works. Let me just speak plainly. Somewhere between 1,000 and 3,000 milligrams a week of anabolic steroids has been the recipe from the 70s to now. It That has not changed. In the 90s, we introduced the application of recombinant human growth hormone. And the model is, how much can you afford? That's the conversation. How much can you afford? Right? With insulin, some people lean into insulin, some people don't, but going into a hyperglycemic state is what controls the amount of insulin that you use. It's not really toxicity per se, it's the risk of a hyperglycemic outcome. You know, so 1,000 to 3,000 milligrams of androgens, as much growth hormone as you can afford, and if you lean into insulin, you know, what holds you back is hyperglycemia. That model hasn't changed for 30, sorry, I don't know whether that's where, 30 years, it, it has not changed for 30 yeah. years. But what I'm saying is if you do that and do that and do that and do that, eventually, inevitably, and, and the timeline varies and the outcome varies, but you're going to come unstuck at some point. So all I'm proposing is, I'm not saying don't do that, but what I'm saying is we want to take that and place that strategically. And what I would argue is this, the framework is real simple. You get as far as you can go naturally. You don't use drugs for things that can be done naturally. That makes no sense. Yeah. I trained and competed for 20 years as a natural bodybuilder. That's, that's far too much. My one regret, if it were, is I went too far. I, I, if I had my time to do over again, I probably would have been natural for six years, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> After six years, there's nothing else coming. That's it. You're done. Like if you haven't acquired skeletal muscle tissue after six years of training, you know, you might put on half a pound a year after that. Yeah. yeah. So I would argue anybody should start run natural bodybuilding as far as they can get, at least compete a couple of times because you will learn a tremendous amount and also gain a tremendous amount of respect for natural bodybuilding by understanding how hard it is to get your, drag your ass on the stage as a natural. It's tough. Yeah. We have this era now people are looking to use appetite suppressants so they don't have to suffer. We have natural bodybuilders that do everything naturally. And we have enhanced builder bodies that are so lazy that they want to take appetite suppressants. They can't even suck up the, the struggle anymore. That's how weak we are. Yeah. So you get as far as you can get naturally. And then you spend the next two to three years of drug exposure walking around an environment where, yes, you want to progress and yes, you want to move forward. But the most important thing is two things. One, to try and get as far as you can with the smallest amount of stress possible. And two, learn as much about these drugs as possible. So eventually you get to the point where you say, I know all I need to know. And at that point, I would say this, I know everything about training. I know everything about nutrition. I know everything about over-the-counter supplements. I understand sleep hygiene and I understand performance enhancing drugs. And then you stop listening to educators and you simply go away and do. Yeah. And you do it for two years, right? Now at that block of time, you've done, let's say five years natural. You've done two to three years of learning. I know everything I need to know. 
Then you do two years of pushing on using that exact framework that I described to you, right? <coughs> so if we, if we add that up, that's 10 years. Yeah. So let's say if you started like me at 15 or 16, a lot of bodybuilders start that young because they're interested. That means that you're 25 or 26 years old. Yeah, plausibly. I still think that's too young, but I'm, I'm trying to work with people here. And at that point, you should be able to look in the mirror and determine whether or not you have what it takes to play for the NBA or not. And if you have what it takes to play for the NBA, you keep going. And if you don't have what it takes, you pull back because more risk isn't justified. Now, the problem is, one, nobody follows that model. People use drugs far too early. People come out the gate with systemic toxicity in the first year. It's completely impossible to justify blast crews year one. You cannot. Yeah. If you take a natural bodybuilder and give him a little bit of androgens and a little bit of growth hormone and a little insulin, he will grow like a weed for at least a year. I mean, a little bit. Yeah. So the idea that you need to blast in year one is a fallacy. It's just made up bullshit. Right. No question. That's not going to last forever. It's very much like natural bodybuilding. Year one, we get impressive results. Year two, diminished return. Year three, diminished return. If you speak to a, a legitimately natural bodybuilder who has actually competed and give him a small amount of androgens to the degree that they're, what I would argue is this is the goal that your doctor doesn't like what you're doing, but he can't tell you why you need to stop level, right? That's all he needs for you one. Anyone that says a natural bodybuilder isn't going to add skeletal muscle tissue to his frame beyond what is plausibly natural with that, that kind of drug strategy is a liar, right? But that doesn't last forever. You can see the escalation model. So eventually and inevitably, we get to the point where we don't have a choice where we have to walk through the high-risk door. But what I would argue is most people, most people simply don't have the genetic potential to walk through the door in the same way that most people will never play for the NBA, ever, right? And if you look at it like that, 95% of what we have done historically and 95% of the people that have exposed themselves to high-risk models, it's impossible to justify. There should be, at this point in the world, something like maybe 5,000 men who have the potential to play the game one in 10 makes it. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So if we said the pool of talent ultimately ends up at 500, right? We could say 5,000 think they've got what it takes. That's fair. And one in 10 drops off. If you look at, I'm ex-military. If you look at things like special forces training, not all men make it. One in 10 might make it. So we take guys who are already soldiers and put them through a value way, and only one in 10 make it. We don't have this mindset. We think anyone can be a bodybuilder. This is a game of genetics. It's got nothing to do with training. It's got yeah. nothing to do with food. If you, if you rank the priorities of things, you would say, this is, a, this is a game of two things. Firstly, genetic response. Did you choose the right parents? And secondly, intent. Because what it takes to do this for 10 years takes a very, either a very special person or someone with mental problems, right? And I mean that quite seriously. I, I mean, I would argue that yeah. a lot of people in our tribe have mental issues. Yeah, and it I sounds very... Uh, they, they says, but a lot of women that attract, we're not talking about women, a lot of women that attract to this have eating disorders. They just do. A lot of men that, that are in the sport suffer from things like body dysmorphia. I do. I look in the mirror and I, see, um, I, I look in the mirror and I see some scrawny teenage kid with an oversized <laughs> head. You're in, and, and reality, I'm in the, you know, like in 2018, I competed in the over 50 minutes, the universe, and I came fifth. But I see, an insecure kid when I look in the mirror. I, I'm not insecure because I'm secure enough to talk about it. Yeah. Most men in this game suffer mental health disorders, including me. I don't see myself the way I am. I'm never big enough. I'm never good enough. I'm never lean enough. That's a psychological issue. And the point I'm making is this is a game of genetics first and then the intent to play the game because what it takes to isolate yourself from the real world, to give up a real career, 
to not have you know family and friends that do real things, to eat like a machine for six meals a day, seven days a week. There's a certain framework that you have to pair genetics and that together, and then the outcome comes. And the and the and the nutrition is the next hardest thing. But the reason the nutrition is the next hardest thing is it's so regimented and it's so difficult. And we've even had this push over the last 10 or 15 years to try and make it easier, but it doesn't get easier. Mm-hmm. Things like if it fits your macros and stuff like that are a very practical models for the general public. Yeah. What it takes to eat a bodybuilder is you're going to spend the rest of your days overfed or hungry. One state or the other. That's how you live for 10 years. I'm either, I feel like the Christmas turkey because I'm being force fed because the amount of caloric intake you have to intake is outrageous. Yeah. Or we're trying to prepare ourselves for a show and we'll walk around not allowing ourselves to be human beings. Right. That's tough. So firstly, genetics and then intent and then nutrition because it's so hard. The training doesn't even matter. It literally doesn't even matter. The range of inputs that you could apply to an enhanced trainer to elicit the chemical signaling cascade that says create a hypertrophic outcome is truly vast. Yeah, we, we know this from historical practice. So it's more, more than anything else, it's personal choice. What speaks to you? I'll give you a simple example. I know it's controversial, but here's the thing. I would argue... For 50 years, we've been arguing about the volume versus intensity debate. It's, yeah. I can explain it to you on a post-it note, and it's over. It's over. It, the evidence today we have suggests that beginners, you know, not experienced lifters, would probably best serve by leaning into increases in volume first. That's what the evidence suggests, right? But at some point, you run out of volume progression. You just run out of runway. You, know, you can't just keep adding volume forever because yeah. then you end up with the four-hour workout. Yeah, in junk yeah. volume. So there's, yeah, correct. So, so there's volume has to, what I would argue is increases in form is the first, first increment of progression. Increase, get your form better. Yeah. Then you add volume because that's what the evidence seems to support. And if you listen to historical educators, guys like Dante Trudell, he will even say he developed his program not for beginners for guys that have been training for a couple of years. It's not meant for first beginners. Why? Because when you're first starting, you're really moving weight through space. You don't have the capacity to elicit the intent of intensity. You don't have enough control. I I like to call it mind-muscle connection. And the point I'm making is, so you start with improving form and then you move to volume. Inevitably, you run out of volume runway because the training becomes too long. So you then you have to turn to intensity. You don't have a choice. Eventually, that runway runs out and you ultimately end up trying to find some type of hybrid model where you switch between both and seek progression. Yeah, that's it. The conversation's over. That's the model for everybody in the world. But here's the thing. You do volume training for, say, two to three years to fulfill that early gains. Then you move into intensity because you don't have a choice, right? And when you ultimately reach the point where you kind of have to create a hybrid, by the time you've been training for five or six years, you shouldn't need someone else to tell you what to do. Yeah, you you know yourself. You should know what speaks to you and what works for you and you make choices for you and you should do that. And if you want to disagree with me at that point, like I don't even have an argument, like just do what you want to do. You're in. People have been training for six years and they're looking for people to provide them with guidance of how they should train. It's like, well, you can't, like you, you lack the skills after six years of doing something to tell me what's right for you. Are you serious? But you know, like many people train like shit from the beginning and don't try to learn and get better. Like people, technique is wacky and stuff. Pe- so people, people don't want to learn. I, I know I, I say things that offend people and upset people, but you cannot argue with them in general. People don't want to learn. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether it's nutrition or supplementation or training or drugs. I have created the biggest revolution in bodybuilding in the last 50 years. Nothing even comes close. I would argue the only thing that comes close is the revolution where we went from volume training to HIT. That was a, that was a big change. Mm 
Yeah. I have this, I've created this model. People don't want to pay $50 to learn what I've paid. You know, it's like, how could you not, how could you not want to learn what we're talking about? Like when you hear me talk about this, it's such a compelling and interesting discussion that anyone that was had the, the mildest interest in performance enhancing drugs should be at this point saying, where do I pay? I have 1,300 paying members. You understand? People don't want to learn. They have absolutely no interest in learning. And I don't just mean me. I mean about anything in this sport. And that's controversial and it's confrontational and everyone gets upset with me. But I'm telling you, they don't want to learn. And the second problem we have is people that are educators don't want to be honest. They have a vested interest in telling the community what they want to tell them so they can make money. You think about it. If I say to you, look at a picture of Dorian Yates and honestly, look at me and tell me that anything of any consequence has changed in the last 30 years. You can't. He, he could stand on stage today and contest for the, the number one shot today. He's a yeah. contender. Nothing has changed. The only new conversation in bodybuilding in the last 30 years is harm reduction. And harm reduction fits into the how we train. Yeah. A lot of guys got injured in the past. That has changed. Right. Even Dorian was one of the most injured bodybuilders of all time. Yeah. So if someone said to me, we have made changes to the way we train, but those changes don't elicit outcome. They elicit harm reduction. This is a true statement. Yeah. And when we talk about nutrition, we used to eat a lot like bros. One of the things I've been pushing is intake of micronutrients and eating in a more balanced way. But that doesn't mean that you grow less tissue or it doesn't mean that you get less lean. It means it's better for gut health. Yeah. So there are absolutely unequivocally interesting and robust conversations to be had in training, in nutrition, in supplementation. But you don't put on another 20 pounds of tissue. You just don't. You don't get to 1% body fat where we used to get to three or four. You just don't. The only interesting new conversations in this game in the last 30 year revolve around harm reduction. Does that make sense? Yeah, That's but all. I'm thinking like if you have, for example, two twins, same genetics, if you optimize nutrition, training, everything, compared to the other twin training like a bro and you know not really like meal plan and training like shit with poor technique then i think the one with optimized techniques the same genetics has more like progression from it but 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 I, you're not wrong you're right but the challenge is that's that's not a reasonable argument i'll tell you why arnold schwarzenegger was consuming one gram of protein per lean pound of body weight before we had any evidence to support that we kind of arrived at that place through trial and error. Mm -hmm. People assume bro means stupid. No, I'm not saying that. Like, no, 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 no. I'm not saying you are, idea. but you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it, it, the, the reality is, is that we kind of arrived at these understandings through trial and error. And it's like, you know, for example, you know, a lot of people have criticized one of the things I introduced. Let's talk a little bit about drugs. I introduced this idea that all anabolic steroids accrete protein tissue at approximately the same rate. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's what else they do that terms which drug we would use when and why. Now, I, I ha have had such a battle, but I've completely demolished any argument. No, no one's ever been able to refute that statement. Let me just give you a simple bro observation. So let's not talk about studies. Let's just be a bro for a minute. That's what bro means. Honestly, after doing this for 50 years, if there was a combination of drugs that you put them together, and when you do this, some type of synergistic effect that happens, that means you get a multiplier effect, right? That it's two times more anabolic than A versus B. Mm -hmm. Collectively, we would have logically arrived at that understanding as a tribe, and we would all do that. And yet, when you line up successful bodybuilders, this guy likes this, and this guy likes that, and this guy likes this. There is no universal agreement on what that stack is. And just the Occam's razor, like the simplest explanation is, if we haven't arrived at that point yet where there is a universally agreed upon 
ratio of the drugs that we use. We use this much of this and this much of that. And when you do it, you grow twice as big, mm-hmm. right? I don't mean, I don't mean 5%. The, the law is it's twice as good or three times as good. You know, the story, trend alone is five times more anabolic than testosterone. Yeah. If that was true, it'd be, it would be observationally true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you cannot argue there is no universal agreement on what drugs we should be using. Everybody has their own opinions and yet they all produce their own champions. And so therefore what you have to say is when you say the bro model, you'd have to say, but it, it, you're suggesting that, and I'm not, I'm not saying that you're saying it in a detrimental way. I'm just saying a lot of people say this, they kind of think that bro means it doesn't work. No, it works, but I'm bro like... Mean, bro means it works, but plausibly there's a better solution, right? That's what Absolutely. it means. Absolutely. Yeah. It's what but I mean. But, but here's the challenge. When we talk about drug stacks, what's the better solution? There is no, there is no better solution. My argument is the reason for the misunderstanding is because these drugs were brought to market for a specific purpose. Most of the drugs used in, in, in the accretion of protein tissue were actually drugs developed for women so that mm-hmm. we could deliver the therapeutic benefits of testosterone to the androgen sensitive. That was their intent. That was their goal. We never developed them so they were twice as anabolic. We developed them so they were less androgenic. So to retain the, the, to retain the anabolic potential at lower androgenic potential, that was the goal. Multiple different pharmaceutical manufacturing companies came along and made their offering. And you should see them like Toyota, Ford, Jeep. You know, these are competitive offerings all attempting to solve the same solution. As a, as a veterinarian, you would understand that these, these are competitors, right? So yeah. why does it not stand to reason that they fundamentally all quote unquote work? You have this blow law that says things like Masteron is not a good growth promoter, but you look at the evidence and go, so Syntec, the corporation that developed this drug, tested this drug more extensively than any other anabolic steroid as a growth promoter. And ultimately, they tested it in rodent models, in cattle models, and they patent the drug as a cattle growth promoter, effectively as a competitor to Turnbulone. And yet we have two drugs here, both of them potential cattle growth promoters, tested by the developers, patented for this purpose. And yet we come along and say, one is five times more anabolic than testosterone and one is less anabolic. I mean, like, could you have a less rational mind? The logic says we should begin this conversation with the assumption that they have equal anabolic potential. That's the assumption. And then we put them into practice and we see what happens. That's fair. Now, what is going to happen is with everything in this world, there is personal choice. Anovar has the same anabolic potential as any other commonly used testosterone derivative, but it doesn't speak to me. I've never understood it. But for me to walk around saying it doesn't work is, that's ridiculous. Of course. Because it works, because there are many people (laughs) that it speaks to. It just doesn't speak to me. Mm. And we've had 50 years of educators that are not educators. They're idiots because they will say things like it doesn't work. Whereas what they should say is these are the choices. The evidence would suggest they have equal potential, but realistically you need to try them on a rotational basis. Three months of this, three months of this, three months of this, and then tell me what your personal experience was so that then if you lean into one or the other, now I'm telling you, if you take 100 people and, and put them on a rotational model with a washout period, every single person is going to have a preference. Every single person will say, I, I lean over here or I lean this way. And if they all lent towards one drug, we would all be using that drug. Do, do you understand what I mean? The logic yeah, here? Yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. we don't. You have people that love Mastron, like myself, but you have people that, think it doesn't work and you have people that love prima bowl and people that think it's too weak and you have people that love anova but that's because people confuse personal choice with cognitive bias towards whether or not it quote unquote works yeah for sure but then also for every drug you have side effects 
Yep. And you have like advantages, disadvantages, and then you can also have an objective point of view on it and not only your subjective way 100%. of experiencing it. A hundred percent. And this is the problem. People don't understand what evidence-based means. So if I can take a moment, yeah. What evidence-based actually means is we need to consider multiple vectors of, of, of thought. The first vector is what does the clinical literature suggest? And not a study. I mean, if we were to immerse ourselves in every single clinical resource that we could find on a subject, what would our takeaway be? Does that make sense? Not one mm -hmm. study everything. And yeah. then the practical application exposure experience. What does 50 years of doing tell us? And very often they're different things. And then personal choice matters. And it's when you stand in the middle and you allow equal weight to each of these considerations that you would consider yourself to be evidence-based. I'll give you a simple example. There is a gentleman called Dr. Mike Isratel. He has a PhD. He thinks he's an evidence-based educator, but he leans so heavily into the science that he cannot understand that he's talking shit. He made the claim, and I debated him once, that Dorian Yates would have been a better bodybuilder if he trained the way Mike trains. This mm. is perhaps the second greatest bodybuilder after Ronnie Coleman the world has ever seen. Right? If it worked for him, what right do you have to say that if you train my way, it would be better. That's, yeah. not, that's not a scientific mind. And yet the man holds a PhD. You understand the point I'm saying? So when people yeah. talk about bro science, the biggest mistake they make is they don't understand that most doctors are bros. <clears throat> oh, most, yeah. most academics are bros. Yeah. Bros is a term that is used to be derogatory. It's meant to be uneducated, unaware, uninformed. And I have a, but I'm telling you, there are half a dozen medical doctors that make content about performance enhancing drugs that are complete and absolute bros. They have a yeah. medical degree and they, they will say things like Anavar is 600% more anabolic than testosterone, a classic quote. It's like, there's, no, there's absolutely no evidence to support that at all, right? There's none. Where did you get that from as a medical doctor? Someone said it, and they parroted what someone said. That's a bro, but that's a medical doctor. Do you understand the, 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 the point I'm making here is we yeah. don't even understand in this community what evidence-based means because if you prefer Anavar and I prefer Mastron, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. Yeah. So this is part of the problem is I, I, I ruffle a lot of fellas and I upset a lot of people in a community, but you cannot argue that Anavar is 600 milligrams, uh, 600% more because it's, there's, there's just, there's not a single credible line of evidence that holds up to critical view. Cause the, what that would mean is if I took a man and I gave him, 300 milligrams of Anavar a week and I took his twin brother the example you used and I gave him 300 milligrams of testosterone that at the end of one year whatever gains the testosterone player had made would be sixfold in the other that mm. has never been observed in the history of our tribe not not one time so even though there's a rodent study done in the 60s that kind of would suggest that is an interesting thing you only have to take that study and start to apply some critical thinking skills to it and say, that's not correct. And we don't have the skills in this tribe to be able to look at studies and say, we can't apply what that study suggests to our community because when we apply it through 50 years of experience, it doesn't follow through. Mm -hmm. And then we have people who don't understand that genetics have such a profound role in this thing most of the voices in our community the reason we listen to them is because of their success in the sport yeah, yeah? and yet the reason they're successful is because they are the genetically elite they don't train harder than other people they don't eat better than other people they don't have better knowledge of performance sensing drugs than other people they just do the same things that everybody else is doing if they know what they're doing yeah but because they have a genetic advantage, they get an exponentially higher hyper response from it. 
And so we lean into them with an air of authority. And then whatever their personal choices were become bro law. Yeah. yeah. So as we go through this conversation, you can see I could talk all day about drugs, but we have a fundamental problem in our tribe that bef- until we embrace it and are honest about it, the, the, the problems with this tribe, we, we apply authority to people who have a position of success based on nothing more than genetic response. We, we lean into people who have you know, academic credentials, but when they speak, dirt falls out their mouth. Yeah, we, in my opinion, go ahead. Sorry, yep. I just wanted to say that uh, a PhD is like an IFB pro status, it doesn't mean everything you talk is right. I would argue this the most there's a framework that I've suggested for eight years because the bit that so the, all of this leads to one question it all it all it all condenses down to one question who do we listen to? Is that fair? How yeah. do we know whether to listen? I would argue this. I have long held this framework. One, you don't listen to someone that's 25. Why? Because in my opinion, at 25 years old, you're just starting your drug journey. You shouldn't be educating others. You know, all you're doing is telling me what you heard someone else say. Yeah. I yeah, want to hear, right. I want to hear from someone that's been doing for th- like ideally 10, 15 years. So how how can you even be speaking about PEDs at 25? You haven't even opened the door yet. So age is the first thing, not because I'm ages, but to do this right, I think you should start drugs at about 22 or 23 years old. Yeah. If someone wanted to go earlier, okay, I'm supportive, but not much earlier. Yeah. So at 25, you just, you don't earn a right at the table because you haven't got 10 or 15 years of experience to speak yet. Yeah, Absolutely. It, like I'm still learning, for example. It, it, it's, it's hard to argue, right? That that's a fair criteria, yeah. right? I the, totally second, agree. The, the, the second criteria I would argue would be this, and that is you need to balance academic credentials and firsthand experience. Like a cla- the classic example, there's a gentleman by the name of Peter Bond, right? And, mm-hmm. He is what I consider to be an academic because he's never used anabolic steroids in his life and yet he educates on them. I don't know how you do that. How can you speak to a subject without it's like teaching how to ride a motorcycle when all you've done is read books on motorcycles? It's like I'm not sure how you even have how, how do you do it? Yeah. I think to be a valuable voice in this experience, this is why my my mentor in this space was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Scott Howe. And he started off as a user and ended up doing a, a PhD on androgen toxicity. You know, like it went the other way around. His interest in the drugs led him to an academic pursuit that ultimately it led to a PhD. Now you're talking about an individual that can speak to both sides of the argument. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's another guy called Dr. Scott Stevenson you might have heard of. Yeah. He's the same. Yeah. Yeah, he's absolutely. a user of drugs. And, he's, and, he, and when he speaks, I have never criticized a single word that he said. Because he speaks with both experience and academic prowess. And so because he has both, he rarely makes mistakes. And when I say rarely, I mean, I've never corrected him. Yeah. You understand? That's the guy you should listen to. He also qualifies from the age criteria. I'm a bit older than Scott, but he's not 25 years old. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And this is the last criteria. And I mean this very strongly. People need to listen to this. Unless you are prepared to submit your claims to peer review, you are not an evidence-based educator. And what I mean by that is anyone at any time under any conditions can ask me or challenge me or refute anything I've ever said in the last eight years. Any word that's come out my mouth, you can say, hey, listen, I need you to explain what evidence are you basing that statement on. Any claim I've made in eight years is on the table. Anyone can refute it in time. I'm the only educator in the world that offers that. Most educators refuse to answer a single question about what they say. In fact, if they make a claim and you approach them and say, listen, Mr. X, what evidence are you basing that on? They will basically block you. You know what I mean? So these are the things, even though I infuriate the community, 
this is my benchmarks. You can't be 25 years old. Ideally, I would prefer if you had academic and experience credentials. Yeah, I think that's the balance. I understand very few people do. I don't. I'm just a bro. Yeah. So when I speak, I'm the voice of experience, but I know the science better than most doctors. Yeah. So this is the interesting thing is I've immersed myself in the clinical literature for 10 years. I'm not telling you what I heard. I'm telling you what I read. Yeah. I've been doing this for 40 years, but it's fair to say my strong card is not my academic credentials because I have none. And yet we live in this community that says, I won't ever be invited to speak at a medical symposium because I'm not a medical doctor. You understand the irony of this? I'm probably the, the, the leading authority in the world today on harm reduction in performance enhancing drugs, but I will never be allowed to address doctors because I'm not part of, the tri of, of their little clique. Yeah. yeah, it's a very big problem here. It's like a huge really problem. And mm -hmm. then the final thing is how can you listen to someone that won't allow themselves to be questioned by their peers? And so here's the problem. I'm just honest. If people get upset with me, they get upset with me. I am the only educator in the world that submits anything I say is up for debate at any time. Like that should be the benchmark. If you make educational content about pharmacology you should be willing to submit anything you claim to peer review that's not an unreasonable request so when i say these things and then you understand people are going to be running around setting their hair on fire because i'm so outrageous but what have i actually said that is unreasonable or unfair i'm not saying because you dress this way or because you're smaller than me or because I have more trophies than me. I'm saying very reasonable and fair things. How is it possible we live in a world in 2023 that there's not a single other voice that talks to PEDs, not one, that will agree to let me question them? Yeah. I this know. tribe is a joke. You understand? It's, it's, not, it's not exaggerating to say it's a joke. And it's time that we woke up and became mature and said, yeah, you're right. 25-year-olds shouldn't be educating. You're right. Like, just can't have that experience. You're right. Ideally, we should have some academic capability and some practical experience. You know, ideally, that would be great. You're right. If someone's making claims about something and someone of my, I've earned my right at the table, I think that's fair. If I want to say, hey, listen, can you explain what evidence that you used to arrive at that position? Can you explain? Like, I have that right. Yeah. And yet I'm the bad guy. I'm the villain. You understand the, the, the challenge that we face today in this community? So we could talk about drugs, and I, I, I would like to set some more time aside to talk about drugs. But I ask people to understand is this is the landscape that education in our tribe exists in. It's a disgusting state of affairs that must be fixed before we can move forward. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about some drugs. So let's specific questions you guys have about drugs. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of questions looking here. So it's about a claim made by a famous Romanian coach who said, once you are thinking about using uh, PEDs, it, it doesn't work to use, for start, less than five, 600 milligrams of testosterone. It's very simple, very simple to argue. Because I trained for 20 years as a natural, okay, the argument is really simple. So what he's suggesting is that natural bodybuilders should be able to use anabolic steroids up to the threshold of 400 milligrams a week, and it doesn't make any difference. Yes, mm -hmm. The argument's over. Like, that's a stupid argument. What, yeah, what, absolutely. Why, why do they have a requirement that an athlete must be clean to qualify for natural competition? And why do they have a, a requirement that qualify that says an athlete must have a, a period of time that he has not used drugs? Typically, it's seven years. Why does that requirement exist in natural federations if... 400 milligrams a week doesn't do anything. Yes, you're yeah. absolutely right here. 
It's just a, it's a, it's a, so it's a, there this are is why so I say it's a, stu- it's a stupid thing to say. Like, it's just a stupid thing to say. Yeah. Yes. As the TRT doses are right between 100 and 200 milligrams. You're not even allowed to use TRT. I'll tell you why you can't use TRT. Well, I, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. So My the, claim is, so if the TRT doses are under 200, yeah. so until 200, there are so many people, they even with less, like 155 or 150, they're going to go over super physiological. I, I, w- I would go further than that. What I would argue is this, so that is the reason they don't allow testosterone replacement therapy in natural federations is when you go into contest preparation, one of the consequences of that is you understand that your hormonal profile tanks. Your testosterone goes into the toilet, your cortisol spikes, your growth hormone goes like shit. Just doing nothing more than taking a physiological range of testosterone under competition preparations provides you with a massively unfair advantage. I would argue, and I have Absolutely argued many right. times, that a small amount of drugs in competition preparation is plausibly healthier for you than natural. But we're talking yeah. about therapeutic replacement dose here. So 100%. you use enough growth hormone and you use enough testosterone and you use enough thyroid hormone and, 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 that effectively you're simply replacing like for like dosages. So you don't have the offset of the consequence of extended caloric deficit and the, and the potential stress that induces. But the idea that if you understand natural bodybuilding, they don't even let you use testosterone replacement therapy at hundred milligrams a week because of the massive advantage you have over a natural athlete. How could you say 400 doesn't do it? It's such a ludicrous and outrageous statement that, People, but this is the problem. Any rational thinking mind should listen to that and then never listen to that man again in his life. The, <laughs> yeah. the, but this is the problem. We have educators that spend nothing more than spending their days talking shit all day, day in, day out, crap, 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 crap. And guys are clicking like button. That's great information. This guy's a fucking genius and stuff like that. I'm going like, like, I'm, I'm sure if you listen to that guy, just because of the stupidity of that statement, that it's it's very plausible that all of his content is garbage. Do you, do Everything you understand? Is garbage, yeah. Everything is garbage. But this is the point: is it's it's not only him; it's the people that listen and don't have enough critical thinking skills to not listen anymore. But like but, the thing is, these big coaches are IVB pros. They yeah. look big. And all the guys want to be the same, you know? So they just start PEDs and they're like, just give me your cycle. Correct. And these IVB pros are just using traditional cycles, like 500 tests, 500 deca, and that's it. So they give exactly the same. They don't know anything about pharmacology. They don't know anything about like drug interaction or just drug but, but, but you, but you are, sorry to interrupt you, but you understand you're never going to get him to change. No, and that's a big problem. But you'll but you'll never get into change. No. And you have to you. you have to accept that. The mm-hmm. only thing that we can do is try to reach the audience. Yeah. Yeah. So so wh- one of my greatest laments is I have spent far too much time arguing with people that cannot be convinced. And what I would argue inversely is there is a relatively small subsection of this community that already know he's talking shit. Right? They already know that the quality of educational content is terrible. And they're looking for a, for, a, for, a, for a better standard. Those are the people that listen to me. I don't need to tell him, I don't need to tell my members that the quality of evidence is bad. They come to me nodding their heads saying, yeah, it's freaking terrible. And then they listen to me and they go, that's quality evidence-based content. And so the point I'm making is, as, as people that run a podcast, as people that educate in their own right, we simply have to accept the fact there's a line that you rule under some people and understand you'll never reach them. And you need yeah. to basically say, e- just let them die. You're in. And then focus our attention, our valuable time and our valuable energy on an audience that can be reached. And those people are people that are either on the fence, they go, that doesn't sound right, right? or people that are even further closer to you that say, 
I know that's shit. But you have to understand, and I'm not joking when I say that's one man in a hundred. The overwhelming majority of people are not intellectually gifted enough to say, that makes no sense. How can they have a natural federation and not let them use drugs and let them use testosterone at 400 milligrams a week and it doesn't do anything? It just doesn't make any sense. And you don't need to read a study and you don't need to be an academic credential, a credential academic to know that just doesn't make sense. It's just critical thinking. Yeah, you're yeah, absolutely right here. Yeah. Okay, next question. So next, next uh, question is from an IFB pro coach that I used to work with him for a very, very short time. So his best cycle he's always recommending uh, for mass building is like starting point at 500 milligram of uh, testosterone with five to 600 milligram of uh, boldenin and 20 to 40 milligram of day of tamoxifen. Mm-hmm. So, the, so the, answer I, to that, the, the answer to that question is really simple. Let me just dive straight in there. So you said 500 tests, five to 600 bold note, right? Yes. Okay. So, so again, if you see it through this filter, all anabolic steroids accrete protein tissue at approximately the same rate. It's what else they do that determines which yeah, one. Absolutely. So, so, so realistically, what he's saying is 1,100 milligrams a week of androgens works. You can't argue. Absolutely. He's right. It works. Like he's right. He's right. And this is is the problem. He's right. The challenge is, is that the most intelligent way to articulate how we arrive at our goals? Or is it simply a description of what what works? You cannot argue. No one in their right mind would try to argue that that 1100 milligrams of androgens is not going to work. It's going to work. It's, it's gonna absolutely going to work. And, and, and this is the problem is, you know, in all manner of things work. So this is the description between what I lean into is saying, I'm not arguing works. I'm not here to argue works. What I'm here to argue is, would I suggest that that's the optimal way to introduce someone to anabolic steroids in a long-term responsible use model? For some people, that's not going to be enough. For some people, 1,100 milligrams of androgens will simply not cut it. But, but the individual I'm addressing is well past recreational use and well on their way to playing for the NBA. You're never going to drag your ass onto the Mr. Olympus stage on 1,100 milligrams of androgens. I don't care what the ratio or combination is. It's just not enough. Yeah, I would yeah, argue... That's, that's right. So, so this is the, the problem is for one man, that's, a, that's, a, that's too much. For another man, that's not enough, but it definitely works. But for us to dissect that discussion, we need to have a much more sophisticated conversation about who are we addressing, at what point in their career, what are they aspiring to, you know, what are their goals? That's a works model. It works, and it works well. But, like, for example, could we optimize a cycle by just choosing other substances? But as you said, everything is as anabolic. It's about the same level. Yeah, so, hey- for example... Like it, it, an optimal cycle with test and PP and yeah. like boldenon, yeah. maybe not doing boldenon and maybe like primo instead. No, 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 I, I, optimal cycles, optimal is incredibly, optimal cycle is incredibly easy. Let's say you wanted nothing more than the mundane goal of adding 20 pounds of quality tissue to your frame. That's all you <laughs> wanted, right? Okay. Yeah. Then the choice is very simple. You'd say, well, if all androgens work, What's the most benign solution that I can put on the table that works? That's yeah. the optimization. We're, we're, we're optimizing for benign. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Everybody should think like this. But, but that's not how people work because they have this delusion that says, look, certain drugs are three times more anabolic than others. And let's be honest. I'm really honest. If there was a drug out there that was three times more anabolic than testosterone and it had a elevated toxicity profile over and above testosterone let's say it was 15 percent more toxic i know that's a silly marker but let's just i'm just trying to make a point here so it was 15 percent more toxic but it was 300 percent more anabolic dude i would sign up for that tomorrow like mm-hmm. who wouldn't yeah 
that degree of toxicity increase for a 300-fold anabolic increase is a bargain. But what I'm saying is, but if they have equal anabolic potential and it's 15% more toxic, in what world does that make any sense? Yeah. So when we're optimizing in protein accretion, we are optimizing for, for the most benign choice we can make. Now, the challenge here is this. That's just protein accretion. And then we start to get into interesting conversations like force production and aggression. And there's definitely a difference in drugs in what we call non-classic genomic signaling pathways. So a classic genomic signaling pathway or a, a, a genomic signaling pathway is where we have a ligon or an androgen that binds with the androgen receptor and there's a cascade of events that spill forth that ultimately results in a very slow but incremental increase in protein tissue. That is the most benign drug discussion. And then we have a conversation that says, look, there are all these other chemical signaling cascade pathways, other receptors, uh, membrane loaded, membrane as opposed to, you know, located within the cell and receptors, and receptors are located on the membrane of the cell itself. We have you know, uh, the relationship between sex hormone binding globulin and you know, that has a receptor in its own right, but sex hormone binding globulin doesn't bind to that receptor until it's bound to an androgen or an estrogen. And, and all of these other pathways that become very fascinating, where that's where we would plausibly lean into more toxic drugs, yeah, because they have a unique relationship that we might leverage. The challenge has always been we get to leverage those drugs, but they tend to be more toxic. Yeah. And this is the, the dilemma of the power lifter versus the bodybuilder. Very often the bodybuilder can simply lean into the most benign drug. Whereas the power lifter to elicit full effect, sometimes the right choice is a more toxic choice. Mm. I would argue that drugs like anadrol and drugs like you know, uh, halotestin and drugs like superdrol it's very hard to describe why a recreational bodybuilder that's trying to acquire 20 pounds of tissue would even think about using those drugs. Like it's a hard use case to make, but it's an incredibly easy use case to make for a competitive strongman. Mm. Yeah? yeah. Because they work to increase force production in ways that testosterone does not. Yeah. Yeah. So who the athletes are, and what their goals are, but let's be honest, most recreational users, I would argue 95% of recreational users, what they seek is mundane. It's like, dude, I want to put on 20 pounds of new tissue. Like, well, the most benign choice is how we optimize. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so for then, example, like, yeah, go for it. And, and then it's a case of what I, what I don't think a lot of people understand is androgens, anabolic steroids are the most toxic drugs that we use. So we have always lent heavily into androgens first. We typically raise toxicity to the point where we ran out of toxicity pathway. And then, and only then, did we walk in other drugs like growth hormone and insulin. And one of the big changes that I've brought here is, historically, professional bodybuilders would say to amateurs, look, you're just an amateur. You don't need to mess around with insulin. You don't need to mess around with growth hormone. That's the worst advice you could give anybody. Because- yeah. The comparative toxicity and comparative risk exposure over 20 years of exposure of drugs like growth hormone and insulin, they're more benign than androgens. So the logic would be is let's lean less heavily into the most toxic pathway and let's start to lean on some of these other benign pathways far earlier in our career. So historically, what we literally said to amateurs was, listen, because you're an amateur, you should lean into the most toxic pathway there is. <laughs> <laughs> like that doesn't make any sense because people believe things like, you know, growth hormone or insulin had a higher risk profile than something like Trembolone. And yeah. it just doesn't. That's, that's, that's made up bro science. And that's what I wanted to ask you about. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have a pyramid that I use when it's about setting up the cycle. Mm -hmm. So like the base is the testosterone. Second floor, are the DHT derivatives. Sure. For me, third floor are GH and insulin. Mm -hmm. And only on the fourth floor, I have the trambolone and stuff like that, like Winstrol and stuff. So Am you, I right? So, 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 you, so you introduce them in an escalated sense. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I would argue that's not the right to go away about it. I'll tell you what I mean by that. Is 
I have removed blast crews from our discussion and replaced it with what's called basal and situational use. And so the idea of basal and situational use is we come out the gate with a moderate amount of androgens, a moderate amount of growth hormone, a moderate amount of insulin as the, at day one. You're in. I don't, I don't mean day one of drug exposure. I mean, for, for an experienced drug your athlete. Yeah. And the whole point is what we're trying to do is moderately modulate multiple metabolic pathways rather than lean too heavily into one. So they're not stacked on top of each other. What there is is basal use, which makes the bottom of the pyramid. Yeah. And then there's yes. situational use, which goes on top of that. And situational yeah, use would, would, would be this. It's not that you introduce growth hormone, but you increase growth hormone. Yeah. Does that make sense? So you might have yes, absolutely. two to three units in the base level of the pyramid. And then you'd say, look, on occasions, I'm going to go from two to three units. If I can afford it, I might go to five units. So you don't introduce growth hormone as a second tier. You increase the volume. And the same thing with the androgens. You don't introduce androgens. You increase the volume of androgens in the second tier. Yeah, I don't disagree that Trembolone belongs on that second tier. Does that make sense? So you might have testosterone and DHT derivative on the bottom tier. And on the yes. so let's say let's describe the bottom tier. So we have testosterone, a DHT derivative, some growth hormone, some insulin, and 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 you know, there's the list, right? And then on the second yes. tier above that, we would say more testosterone, more DHT, more growth hormone, plausibly more insulin, and then we introduce trembolone. Because yeah. Trembolone um, trem, is typically introduced as a situational, not a basal use drug. Yes. So probably uh, I I say it a bit uh, messy. So mm -hmm. you got me wrong a little bit. I am not building up like this. It's just like you said. Using them all together, yeah. smaller amounts, and this stuff, this occasional using drugs like the Trembolone are coming on the top. So I would use um, before the Trembolone all the other, other things. Mm. I mean, I go before the Trembolone for insulin, for a GH, for DHT derivatives. But I mean, next to the testosterone, the first choice is never going to be a Trembolone. Can, can, I, can I explain to your listeners why Trembolone is a situational use drug, if that's right, yeah? So yes, if you understand that all anabolic steroids accrete protein tissue at approximately the same rate, absolutely. Trembolone is a steroidal SARMs. It would introduce by a French company as a competitor to everything else, right? It's not more anabolic than anything else. It has the absolutely. same approximate anabolic potential as everything else, but it has a unique relationship with other receptor classes, okay? that make it yes. interesting because it allows us to leverage Trembolone in certain circumstances. The two outstanding ones are under high catabolic stress. It has a unique relationship with the glycol chorus. Uh, the, the receptors. Correct. That doesn't mean that other anabolic steroids do not also have a relationship, but it has a more profound relationship. Yeah. And it also, yes. so it protect, provides us with a degree of catabolic protection that other drugs don't. And this is why very often we tend to, you know, wheel out Trembolone in contest prep. Yep. It also plausibly increases aggression. Everybody kind of knows that. We call it divorce in a bottle for a reason. Yeah. So in certain circumstances where you're deliberately and intentionally trying to channel aggression, a small amount of that would make sense. But again, that's not something that you would leverage on a 365 days a year basis. Protein accretion is a daily discussion. Every day, day in, day out, day in, day out. Leveraging aggression, I would argue that's not healthy. You would maybe use that on a periodized or situational use basis. Sometimes under certain circumstances, when we're, when we're chasing a particular goal, Elevating aggression makes sense, but systemically elevating it 365 days a year plausibly may lead to cognitive issues. Now, when I say plausibly, I introduced the discussion about brain health. 
people lost their freaking minds. They set their hair on fire. But the reality is, is that the, the, there are seven toxic pathways. This is a, 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 a framework introduced by Scott Howe, the guy I mentioned before. There are seven of them. Toxicity of the central nervous system of the brain is one that has never really been discussed before. It's kind of the new thing, yeah? And, and what we know is that we don't have great data, but there are certainly enough fragments of data that would suggest in order, things like growth hormone would be considered neuroprotective, yeah? Things like testosterone at moderate doses, because of not only the androgen itself, but because of its estrogen profile, we would see as neuroprotective, yeah? DHTs are not neuroprotective, but they're the best of a bad choice, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yes. And, and the worst choice that you could make plausibly is a steroid or progestin. So it's not like we're saying, you know, DHTs are good and trembolone is bad. We're saying that's the that's a better bad choice. Yeah. Yes. Because absolutely. if you're going to, if you're going to raise androgens, you're introducing plausibly cognitive toxicity, neural toxicity. But if you do that, what I would be doing is saying, let's lean into testosterone first. That's considered neuroprotective at moderate dosages. Let's then put out the, 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 the best of the bad choices second, the HTs, and let's leave the worst of the choices. And arguably, based on the data we have at the moment, the worst of the bad choices are Trembolone and Dianabol. They are considered to be on the limited data that we have and you know, we will probably get more data as we move forward, but it, it does make sense when you understand how these drugs are derived. Steroidal progestins potentially have greater negative impact than DHTs. It's not one is good, one is bad. They're both bad. Best and what about nandrolone? Nandrolone is a steroidal progestin as well. So I, I would argue this, that is the best <laughs> argument you could make for using 90 Nord and 19 or derivatives is the dose is the poison. It always, this is always true of drugs. Yeah. So if you're talking about 200 milligrams a week of nandrolone, I would argue the Delta between, you know, prima bowl and nandrolone is pretty small. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's marginal. Yeah. And so, you know, like again, trembolone is a case of if you're using 50 milligrams a week of trembolone, the historical clinical human use dose, what is the real neurotoxicity? We don't really know. Like, you know, we don't have an answer, but it's plausibly more than nandrolone. Yeah. And nandrolone is plausibly more than prima bola. So it's like, you know, so we have this sliding scale of plausibly true. Yeah? yeah. But observationally, I think it's fair to say that, you know, people know trembolone's notorious for it in the same way they know halotestin's notorious for it. It just, mm. you're like, it's like ah, anger in a bottle. You're right? But yeah. that's dose dependent. I don't know anyone that has, major traumatic anger issues on 50 milligrams of trembolone, but escalate the dose and eventually the bill comes due. Yeah. And so the same thing is true of nandrolone. Observationally would say, well, if, if there's a dose response relationship, it's not a digital discussion. It's a, you know, the dose is a poison discussion. Then if we're going to lean into drugs where we escalate the dose and you want it to be as safe as possible, then Plausibly, we use as much testosterone as we can tolerate, and then we use as much DHT deliveries. And then, you know, we don't. I'll give you a classic example. Anovar does not scale. I mean, how do you get to a thousand milligrams a week of Anovar? You just can't. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're, you're the point I'm making. Yeah. So, so when we're talking about increasing the dose at the point that we do, Anovar is just not a practical candidate because it just doesn't scale well. Testosterone <laughs> scales well. Nandrolone scales well. Prima Bolan scales well. But Winstrol and you know these other they just don't scale well. How do you get to a thousand milligrams a week of Winstrol? You just can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when we talk about increasing the dose, really it's a conversation about, okay, so testosterone, nandrolone, prima bowl, and mastron. Yeah. And I don't know yes. necessarily that the argument between scaling nandrolone and scaling prima bolin is a life-changing argument. It's hard to say it's profound. I just think you should be aware of the discussion so you can make a decision. Now, the interesting thing for me is I prefer Mastroid anyway. But if you said to me, but I'm the individual that prefers Nandrolone and I want to lean into Nandrolone, okay, and, and the only thing that you were doing wrong, if you were doing everything else right, yeah, and your one 
sin was leading into Nangelone, like you're in front of 99.9% of the population on the face of the planet. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? Like it's a, it's a, it's a small thing. Just be comfortable doing it, but don't lean into Nangelone on some made up bro science that it's more anabolic than testosterone and prima bolon is less anabolic. That's silly. Yeah. It's just silly. You know? So this is the problem we had though, before people lent into escalating Nangelone on made up bro science, like it was more anabolic. So let's use that. And I would say, well, if you want to use that and it speaks to you, then okay, use that. But just understand it is a straw to progest it. Yeah. So brain toxicity. Plausibly. But this is, but it's like, I, I mean, people hate when, I mean, and again, I'm not an academic, people use that term, but that's what the evidence suggests. Mm-hmm. You're in, we don't, we cannot speak unequivocally to these things because we just, I mean, you have to understand five years ago, nobody was talking about brain health. And I introduced the yeah. conversation. We just don't have enough data to be making hard statements about this does this and that does that. I think it's fair to say just observationally, when people escalate Trembolone, they start to introduce things like disrupted sleep hygiene, increased aggression. Or, you know, you see, the to- you see the cognitive toxicity leak out in behavior. Yeah. And those behaviors very typically are cognitive behaviors. So it doesn't take much to say, you know, something's something's going on there. Yeah. That, yeah. If that if that if that drug's not more anabolic than testosterone, if you understand it's a steroidal psalms, it's not more andro- androgenic. So it's not what we see is the aggression doesn't come from the androgens, the androgenic component. The anabolic potential is the same. So it's the fact that it's the steroidal progestin that's causing the problems. Mm-hmm. This is the critical thinking pathway. Whereas historically, people used to say the reason that you get, you know, see anger problems is because it's more <coughs> powerful than testosterone, but that's that's not true. And I have a spicy question for you. Do you oh. think testosterone, uh, testosterone trenbolone has application for female use? It does. I would argue that it's more female friendly than testosterone. Yes, this is why I'm asking because it's not right. as androgenic. So it could be used in theory, but nobody it, does it. it right? I actually know a lot of women that use Trembolone. I know a really? lot of women. Yeah. Okay. Typically okay. they are, however, you have to understand, I introduced this discussion about the transgender data set and people lost their freaking minds, right? Do you know, you, know, you understand this argument that people that are born as females that wish to identify as males the therapies that we apply to those people to allow them to be identified as males are what female bodybuilders do, <laughs> basically. Yeah. You know, that's the same therapy. Like, and, and people <clears throat> people lost their minds because they're suggesting that I said they're transgender. That's not what I'm saying at all. It's the same therapy. The yeah. difference is that they're deliberately and intentionally trying to elicit the secondary male sexual characteristics that we're trying to avoid in females. Yeah. yeah. And so there are a great many women who really honestly, like if, if someone wants to identify as a male, I'm very like, okay, cool. Let me show you how to do that. Like I'm, I don't have a problem with that. Like if that's what you want to do, then let me help you fulfill your wishes. It's your body. right? And you have to understand somewhere along that scale are women that have realized degree of virilization that no longer care. Now it's those women whose voice is already gone right, and things like that, that tend to lean into Trembolone more because they realize that you're in the degree, the, the amount of drugs that women, let's talk, is okay we talk about women? Is that okay? Yeah? Yeah, so yeah the, absolutely. The, 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 the amount of androgens and the amount of performance enhancing drugs that women need to realize, to use to realize the outcomes they desire is much smaller than men. Much, much smaller. So the discussion about women is not about organ toxicity per se, it's about yeah. virilization. Mm-hmm. And we know this from the transgender data where your endocrinologist is happy to give you as much androgens as you like, right up to the point where you physically identify as a male. He's not worried about kidneys. He's not worried about your heart. He will tell you, be aware this will affect your brain. You will start to think like a man, right? But it's not toxicity, it's behavioral modification. Yeah. And so... You have to understand that when you apply these drugs at dosages less than that, if we don't see toxicity in transgender studies, then we're not going to see toxicity at less than that dose. Mm 
logic, yeah? So the conversation then again is not about organ health, it's about virilization. And the three areas of virilization typically are changes to sexual anatomy, yeah? Mm -hmm. Changes to body hair and, and facial hair and changes to the vocal architecture. Now, yeah. the truth is most women that use androgens that see an increase in sexual architecture, they're not complaining about it because, I hope I could use the word clitoris, if, if you see an increase in clitoral size of, say, 10% or 15%, most women actually surprisingly welcome that. They go, my sex life is actually better. There's this yeah. fear of the fact that you've developed this, like, microphallus in place of a clitoris. That's, like, I know transgender women that are clients of mine that are physically trying to out elicit their outcome, and they're frustrated because they cannot get that outcome. They want that outcome, and it won't come from them. They're rubbing DHT cream into their clitoris trying to make it grow. It's, it's not like you take a little bit of androgens and suddenly you develop a microphallus. It doesn't work that way. The, the increases are relatively moderate and, and trackable. And most women, they really don't have a problem with it because you're talking about relatively small increases in, in, in volume yeah, and increases in, in, in pleasure. It's, it's, it's way overstated, that conversation. Yeah? It's a conversation. It's a real thing, but it is overstated. Most yeah. women in this sport wax their bodies anyway. They don't care. Oh, that's your... I mean, the whole body gets done. Yeah. During, so if you have an increase in, in body hair and you don't wax yourself, if you're a, a citizen Joe, as it were, I can understand that it would be classified as you know, an adverse effect. But if you're already waxing your entire body and you ain't see an increase in body hair, it's not really the end of the world. Yeah, right. you solve it super easily. Correct. It's a superficial discussion for the most part. Yeah. The big thing about women is changes to the vocal architecture. And so that's, really... that's the killer. That's the killer. Yeah. And what people don't understand is the male and female voice box before puberty is physically identical to each other. It's the application of androgens that causes the virilization of the voice box. And unfortunately, once it happens, there's no going back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so... A lot of, like, if they could go back, again, logic says, if you could actually unviralize a voice box, then transgender individuals that were once born as men could sound like women. It's not possible. Yeah. Oh, surgery. There is surgery and there's vo vocal training techniques. But, if I mean, I live in Thailand. You have to understand, we have the world's greatest transgender population here. I could tell a lady boy, the, uh, half the time, the only reason you could tell is there's something wrong with their voice. Mm -hmm. They're stunningly attractive yeah but when they speak it gives it away you're in mm -hmm. you, yeah. and, and, and and if they could fix it they would fix it yeah but they cannot fix it so mm -hmm. there's a few little telltales the size of their feet the size of their hands you're in you can't tell by looking at their face you cannot yeah but you can tell by listening to their voice yeah, yeah. the point i'm making is simply this you cannot correct vocal architecture that has been <clears throat> realized yeah so my point being is once you've crossed that threshold, a lot of women then don't care anymore and they tend to lean into more aggressive yeah, no, drugs. Like, yeah. Cool. So what I would suggest is coming out the gate as a bikini athlete, Trembolone is not on the table. But there's because a lot you of think it would change the architecture of the vocal cords? Like to no, all, extent, all, 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 all I would say is that there are other drugs that arguably uh, are more female friendly. Okay. Yeah. And, and the reason I say arguably is because all we have to compare them to are rodent studies. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah. now the rodent studies would suggest <laughs> the degree of viral, uh, the, uh, the degree of androgenicity between tremble and other drugs is marginal. But there is this anecdotal kind of observation that maybe that's not true. And so we would plausibly lean into, let's lean into the, the safer path, like, you know, just rationally. Yeah. So I know this, and that is that primabolin is the one drug that was tested at 1,200 milligrams a week in androgens in women for a year. So if someone wanted to make an argument for what is the most female-friendly drug based on the current evidence that we have, it has to be primabolin. Mm -hmm. yeah? Because there are no drugs on Trembolone at 1,200 milligrams a week. Like, like it doesn't exist. There is no, there's a, there's studies on ma Masteron at a thousand milligrams a week, thousand and fifty, and Prima Bolin. Anavar, we don't have anywhere near that. 
not even close. So if you wanted to try to line them up, you would say, look, we're, we're, we're stretching the tape here a little bit. There's not great evidence. But if I had to rank them, what I would say is Mastron has demonstrated itself to be less androgenic than Nandrolone. Yeah. That's that's how we ended up with it as a as an estrogen mediated breast cancer drug. They compared it to Nandrolone. They both worked, but Mastron was marginally less androgenic. So that that we have data that suggests that's true. Mm-hmm. We also have data that suggests that Prima Bolin may well even be less androgenic during, but it was never a head to head study. It was disparate studies that were trying to take, get a takeaway by holding them together, and that's not a great way to do science. Yeah. So, but I would argue, does it really matter? What you should probably do as a woman is is experience Prima Bolin <laughs> and experience Nandrolone and experience Anavar and experience Mastron in the same way that a man should on a washout basis. And then I ask you the question, based on your personal exposure experience, do you lean into one of these drugs? Yeah. I don't think the Trembolone needs to go on the table, but I certainly know a great many women have already experienced virilization and are less concerned about that effect that lean into it. Yes. Okay. Okay. So not for women who are not virilized yet, like no voice change and everything. Let me explain what I would argue the female strategy to be, because again, I've introduced what I call the black female models. They're very simple. Our historical approach to women and androgens was we treat them like little men, right? And we start them on, you know, Anavar at 10 milligrams a day or whatever like that. That's the first drug out of the box, anabolic steroids. And what I would suggest is that's completely wrong. What you do for women is you try to get as far as you can with drugs that are physically incapable of introducing virilization in women. Now, it doesn't mean they don't have problems, it means that they can't introduce virilization. So we take all the drugs that we might plausibly use, we write a list down, we split that list into virilizing drugs and non-virilizing drugs. We start the journey with non-virilizing drugs and we leave anabolic steroids, the virilizing drugs, to the very last gambit. And then what we do is we put them in play, but for the minimum strategic block of time we can. And what I would argue is that you know, in 12 weeks a year, okay, at moderate doses is probably going to be okay. The problem has always been, if you give a woman a drug for 12 weeks a year, what are you going to do for the other nine months of the year? Mm. Well, you keep the other ones, like GH. You, you, and, that's, and that's the point, is you have a basal play, which is a non-virilizing yeah. play, and then, you have a, yeah, and then you have a situational play, which is you walk them in. Now, what I would argue is there are very few women on a situational play that are not going to have their needs fulfilled by using either, you know, Anavar or Prima Bolin or Masteron or Nandrolone. There are very few women that you would even need to introduce Trembolone. In, as I said, I'm kind of somewhat repeating myself, but those women tend to be more hardcore. Mm-hmm. Like they're, 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 they're the hardcore of the hardcore. And that they have already <laughs> d- experienced the degree of virilization. They no, it, it no longer is a pressing concern for them. They don't care anymore. And the amount of trembolone they're using is not really a toxicity issue because they're using clinical dose, like 50 milligrams a week or so. Mm. Okay, good. Yeah, but if anyone wanted to argue, this is the argument just to, to, to let people know. If the clinical dose of Anavar was 140 milligrams a week, right, and the clinical dose of Trembolone was 50 milligrams a week, <coughs> Trembolone would rationally need to be three times as androgenic as Anavar to have an equivalent outcome. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Right. Yeah. So, like, you know, I, I mean, any woman that was using 150 milligrams of trend a week, I'd be, <laughs> that's a lot of trend. So this is, and, and you see, this is the challenge is like, if someone said to me on a milligram basis, Trembolone is more androgenic than Anavar, I would say, yeah, that's probably true. But I know lots of women using, you know, 140 milligrams a week of, of Anavar. So we have a three to one offset before we even at equivalent dose yet. Hmm. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. How about we, I, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that we've been talking for an hour and a half. I could talk for yeah. five hours. So how about we do yeah. one more question and we, and we, and we wrap it up. Um, I have another one uh, made by Alex Kikel about okay. Lantus yeah. insulin. Cool. I, I, don't, so I don't know what say, he said about Lantus. I, this will be new to me. Yeah. Uh, so he said, there are two ways to use it. Mm -hmm. So you can use it like, like you say, like every day, 10 units, 10 units, 10 units for a whole week. Or you can use it twice a week, 25 units on the days you are training weak body parts. You understand me? I just moved myself, yeah. Uh, he's right, though. But, but hey, here's the challenge, and that is, there is no negative. So, so I need to cover key color key points. There is no negative feedback loop attached to the secretion of insulin. You understand that? Right? So there's, yeah, absolute, there's absolutely no reason that you cannot apply insulin once a week strategically. That's a valid discussion. Yeah. Let me first explain how we get to 10 units, 10 units, 10 units. So what we're using insulin for is to replace our basal insulin secretion. Absolutely. Okay. Now, typically, a healthy young man will secrete approximately 20 international units of insulin a day, basal level. So we start at 10, but plausibly we increment from 10 to 11 to 12 to up, up to 20. I tend to stop at 20 units a day. Why? How do we arrive at that number? That's the amount of insulin we, we secrete basically every day. Now, could you then use a long-term insulin? And this is a separate discussion. So that's the first conversation. Yeah? Could you use a long-term insulin on a you know, a sporadic or, you know, in strategic basis, like here and there, there's no reason you couldn't do that. But what I would argue is what benefit does it derive over and above the alternative of using a basal insulin, a rapid acting insulin versus a long acting insulin? I'm not, I'm not sure what the competitive advantage of the option is. Like what, what, are, you, what are you trying to achieve is the question. That was my question also. That makes any sense to use yeah, it? Yeah, well, it works. Or... I mean, you can't, you, I mean, only a fool would argue it, it wouldn't work. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. But I don't, it's, it's difficult to argue that there is an advantage or a disadvantage. Like, sorry, it's, it's difficult to, sorry, let me, I, I messed that up. Sorry, let me, let me retract that. It's difficult to argue that there would be an advantage over using Lantus in that way, as opposed to using some Lantus and a, and a strategic placed Humalog. I'm, not, I'm yes. not, sure, not sure what he's trying to exactly do. Exactly yeah. what me and Eleanor we were talking yesterday yeah. about. But, yeah. but and, and this is where I try to be careful, but it's not fair to say it's wrong. It's not fair to say it doesn't work. It's fair to say, I'm not. I'm. I'm not sure what you're reaching for. That's what. That's fair to say. I'm not sure what you're trying to elicit. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Cool. All right. Good. Let's enjoy Ready the conversation. I hope, you, I, I hope the people listening. I, I, I let me let me just close off if I can. Let me state make close off. Right. The, the, the great challenge that I have is hopefully people would appreciate when they listen to what we're talking about. My my answers are rational and their logic and their evidence based and they're very difficult to argue with but at any point if anyone wants to come up to me and say victor i don't understand the point you're making how did you arrive at that decision that is their right that is their absolute right to say how what evidence what observational evidence what clinical literature what personal choice are you putting on the table to support that claim? That is your right as a listener to reach out to me and ask me that question. I think that is the obligation of everyone that speaks on PEDs. It's not optional that you get to opt out of that. And the problem is we live in a tribe where today, in 2023, I am the only person that allows people to do that. You can ask me, how do I write that? Other people will walk off, call me a dickhead, block me. And you have to, I just ask people to reflect on that. And that is, that's outrageous. It's completely outrageous that we allow as a tribe, people that speak with the voice of authority to behave in that way. Mm 
and it's time for it to stop. And the only way it stops is you stop listening to them. You have to set, you have to draw a line in the sand and say, listen, I refuse to financially support or, or, or support in any way. And that includes even listening to someone that refuses to submit their claims on drugs to peer review. I do not think that is unfair. I don't think it's outrageous. I don't think it's being childish, as people accuse me of. I think that's the only way forward. And I truly believe in the next five to 10 years, we will, as a community, mature and will start to set that benchmark as the minimum benchmark. If you come on a show like this and you make claims about PEDs, anyone in the comments below would like to say, I would like Victor to defend da da da. Yeah. And I'm happy to do that. That that's the benchmark. That's not childish. That's mm. the benchmark. Yeah. So I enjoy coming on. Yeah, I thank hope, you. Uh, I thank hope you. your listeners enjoyed the show and uh, maybe they can uh, I've got my little website there, a little bit of self-promotion, Prep Coach Academy. Yeah, I, I, but maybe I can do that. I, I run the world's only evidence-based educational portal on performance enhancing drugs. I have a free 90 minute video that explains the fundamentals of the framework of the site. So people can come over and get a sense of what's on offer. Watch the video for, for free for 90 minutes at the end of the 90 minute video. If you're interested in learning more then membership to the site is 50 us dollars a month. I think that's very fair. You pay as you go and you retain membership as long as you feel like you're getting value. And at some point in time, one month, two months, five months down the track. Anytime you want, you can cancel your membership. And I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to come on the show and, and share that with your with your audience. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So people can find you on Victor Black Masterclass. Uh, the, be and the, the best way to go is Prep, Prep Coach Academy. Prep Coach Academy now? Okay. Good. Yeah, I, I still have the Masterclass site. We're in the process of merging the two together. So okay. his historically, I was creating a site for coaches and a site mm -hmm. for the general public. But mm -hmm. I have decided to merge them together because I think I'm getting, as time goes by, I think I'm getting better at articulating the message in a way that everybody can understand. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, do, yeah. I do confess that, you know, eight years ago, some of my language is a little bit jargon loaded and I would say things and people go, what the hell is he talking about, right? I, I, I try now to articulate such, a, such in, things in such a way that, if you are a doctor, if you're a PhD, you go, yes, that's correct. He's not, he's not, he hasn't dumped it down too far. But also if you're a user, you go, I can follow along. So I'm trying to merge the two sites into one today. Okay, good. Perfect. Cool. Lovely. Well, thank you so much. All right. Thank you, guys. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Yeah, see you. All bye. right. Thank you, Victor. Sorry, <laughs> see you.